Let us now read together Lord's Day 33 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 33. Of how many parts doth the true conversion of man consist? Of two parts. Of the mortification of the old and the quickening of the new man. What is the mortification of the old man? It is a sincere sorrow of heart that we have provoked God by our sins and more and more to hate and flee from them. What is the quickening of the new man? It is a sincere joy of heart in God through Christ and with love and delight to live according to the will of God in all good works. But what are good works? Only those which proceed from a true faith are performed according to the law of God and to his glory, and not such as are founded on our imaginations or the institutions of men. If Lord's Day 33, beloved, could be summarized in one word, that word would have to be conversion. Question 88, the first question of Lord's Day 33 asks, Of how many parts doth the true conversion of man consist? The answer specifies two parts, the mortification of the old man and the quickening of the new man. And these two parts are then explained in the next two Questions and answers. The mortification of the old man. Question answer 89. And the quickening of the new man. Question and answer 90. That is. That's what conversion is. These two parts. Which are explained. In question and answers. 89 and 90. And in the explanation of the positive part of conversion. Namely. The quickening of the new man, good works are mentioned, and then good works are explained in the last question and answer of Lord's Day 33, namely question and answer 91. But notice where it all started in Lord's Day 33 with conversion. By the way, if you look back to the last question and answer of the previous Lord's Day, you'll see that Question 87 asks, Cannot they then be saved who, continuing in their wicked and ungrateful lives, are not converted to God? Conversion then. If one word is all you have to sum up Lord's Day 33, that would have to be your word. But now notice the backdrop of conversion here is Gratitude. Question 87 talks about ungrateful lives. Answer 86 says that believers must testify by the whole of their conduct their gratitude to God for his blessings. And more generally... Lord's Day 32 and Lord's Day 33 all the way to the end with Lord's Day 52. The whole final section, the third part, is entitled of thankfulness. So we're dealing with conversion within the framework of gratitude. And then the question asks itself, What is the relationship between gratitude and conversion? And the relationship is reciprocal. That is, the professing Christian who is not grateful for his salvation in Jesus Christ has no real interest in conversion. The professing Christian who is very grateful... For his deliverance from sin and misery in Jesus Christ. Is very interested in conversion. So the more grateful you are. 
the more you are seeking daily conversion as a child of God, and the less grateful you are, the less effort you are putting into putting away the old man and the quickening of the new man. And to stress again, I'm not now speaking about initial conversion, the conversion of someone who is currently an unbeliever. I'm dealing here with, because Lord's Day 33 is dealing here with, the ongoing conversion of the Christian who has already been initially converted when he's brought to repentance and faith for the first time. So how interested then are you in conversion tonight? In the truth of conversion, which we're going to be explaining. In the practice of conversion, so that you desire with all your heart to walk in newness of life. And that's a very appropriate question, because that's Lord's Day 32. And a very important question, because it is a fairly good indicator of where we are spiritually tonight. It's a measure of our spiritual temperature this evening. How much we're interested in conversion and how grateful we are, that's where we're at in our spiritual life tonight. <coughs> and at this point, I want to bring in Romans 6, which we read earlier, and particularly verse 4. Which reads, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. We're not going to say much about that part tonight. We actually have dealt with that fairly recently in the last few months in various ways. But we're interested in this part. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead, physically, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk spiritually, in newness of life. And from that last phrase of Romans 6 verse 4, and that in the light of Lord's Day 33's conversion in the framework of gratitude, we're going to look tonight at walking in newness of life. Walking in newness of life, the calling of all Christians. What and how? What is it to walk in newness of life? And how do we walk in newness of life? <laughs> the most unexpected and striking word in the second half of Romans 6 verse 4 is glory. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father... Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. You and I, assuming for the minute that God entrusted us with writing an important spiritual religious document, would never have written this. We would have spoken of some attribute or perfection of God manifested in his raising Jesus from the dead. And in all probability, we would have said, power. We would have written, Christ was raised up from the dead, not by the glory of the Father. We would have said, Christ was risen, was raised from the dead by the power of the Father. And this phrase, the glory of God, or the glory of the Father, essentially the same thing, is not an attribute of God like other phrases which sound the same. The glory of God isn't on the same par, as it were, with the long-suffering of God, or the mercy of God, or the immutability of God, the fact that he doesn't change, or the omniscience of God, that he knows everything. The glory of God, it's the X of God, all right, linguistically, but it's not on a par with the other attributes of God. The glory of God is, as it were, 
the brilliance of all of God's attributes. It is the effulgence of all of the divine perfections. If you take, for instance, the colors of the rainbow and spin them around, you'll get white. And the idea is that with the perfections of God, if you look at them together, it blinds you, as it were, makes you think that's too too bright, too glorious. It shines with a divine effulgence. All the attributes of God which are one in him, power, wisdom, holiness, mercy, long-suffering, the radiance of all the divine attributes which are one in him, that's the glory of God. It's worth adding here, for sake of completeness, that there are times in the Bible where the Son, the second person of the Trinity, is called the glory of God or the glory of the Father. John 1 verse 14 refers to him and his glory as the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But the glory of Romans 6 verse 4, the glory of God, it's not dealing with the second person here, but the effulgence of the divine attributes or perfections. So let's then consider some of the aspects of God's glory that raised Jesus Christ from the dead to see what it teaches us about our walking in newness of life. Because the the verse in Romans 6 has a comparison. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. This is easy to prove, not only in fact, but also from specific scriptures, such as 1 Corinthians 6 verse 14, which says that God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Ephesians 1 verses 19 and 20 refers to the exceeding greatness of God's power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. It's very easy to see why scripture speaks about Christ being raised from the dead by the power of God. Obviously, it takes power to raise someone from death to life. If mankind had that sort of power, he would do it. But despite all his efforts, he hasn't got that sort of power. Only God has. It takes power to transform Jesus Christ from mortality to immortality. <coughs> to raise him to a glorified human nature, he who previously walked in a weakened human nature and then dwelt for a time under the shadow of death. There's something about the glorious power which God wrought in raising Jesus Christ from the dead that's to be shown in the godly lives of believers. Now the idea is not that we can disappear, as it were, and leave our clothes in the same shape they were in, that was the way Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. You remember the way it's recorded in the gospel according to John. He lay on that slab in the sepulcher and he was raised from the dead without 
taking off the sepulchre wrappings, he just disappeared and the clothing kept the same shape of his body. Now the glorious power that is in the life of the believer doesn't allow us to do anything like that. It doesn't allow us either, unlike Christ's glorious new life, simply to appear somewhere. For Christ would simply appear, as he did on occasion, in a locked room, just in the midst. There is a glorious power of God in the life of the believer, but it's not seen in such things as those. The glorious power of God is seen in the believer in the post-apostolic age, not in snake charming, not in uttering a foreign language without ever learning it, never mind speaking in gibberish, not in raising somebody else from the dead, but in such things as self-control. So that we don't simply lash out, let's say, at our children or anybody else who annoys us. And you say, I thought he was going to talk about something fantastic. He's going to talk about the glorious power of God. And all he said was, well, it means that we're able to control ourselves so that we don't lose our tempers. Big deal. Well, Solomon says that it takes more power to control yourself than it does to capture a city. So that is actually more powerful than invading and conquering Asia, let's say. God rates power different from what we do. Taming our tongues. The glorious power of God is seen in being able to control your tongue. And you say, that's fairly easy. Ah, but it isn't, and you haven't been watching yourself. Because James 3 teaches that it is easier to tame or train a dog or a snake or any other animal than to control what you say. The glorious power of God is seen in the believer's life in that he is enabled to lift his thoughts towards heaven. And maybe you're getting disappointed because you're saying, hey, you're talking about the glorious power of God and you're just talking about things like this. But that requires a lot more powerful, as you will discover as you try it yourself, because when you're meditating in the scriptures and trying to think, as Colossians 3 commands us to do, about things above where Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God, you will find that you can think about just about anything apart from that. Because of the old man wrestling against us. Because naturally our thoughts are entirely earth bound and carnal. We need this glorious power of God in order to carry our cross. In order to fight the good fight of faith. In order to wrestle with God in prayer. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory, including the glorious power of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead was not only the fruit of God's power, but also his glorious wisdom. No doctor... And not even the whole of medical medic, mort, mort, try again, modern medical science, which certainly has its place and we all benefit from it, it doesn't have the wisdom to bring someone back from the dead, to put vision back into unseeing eyes, to bring movement to inert limbs. And one would think to oneself, if only, if only they could, because you'd be very tempted to choose it. And our walk in newness of life should also reflect the very wisdom of God, because it took the divine wisdom to raise the Son of God from the dead according to his human nature. 
We are called to show the wisdom of God in our life by walking circumspectly before our enemies. By knowing how to behave in a tight spot. By adapting to extremely difficult and painful and trying circumstances. To use our tongues so that they utter wise and kind (coughs) words like the woman in Proverbs 31. Here's James chapter 3. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Walking in newness of life according to the same wisdom that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And which wisdom is set forth in 101 practical ways, especially in the book of Proverbs. That's the same wisdom that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And which is exemplified in the believer's walk. But now... I hope you're not saying, or tempted to say, well, I thought we were going to hear something a lot more exciting. I thought we were going to hear about something an awful lot more difficult. But instead, I hope you're saying, this is really difficult. I find this hard. I keep sinning and coming short of God's glory. Not God's righteousness, but God's glory. For the same reason as God's glory is mentioned in Romans 6, verse Four. And so that we all take heart, we remind ourselves of God's promise regarding wisdom in James 1. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And at this we're not saying, probably a quarter of us will be asking for wisdom at this stage. Or if you see the stupid things that he does, he would need to be asking for wisdom. But we say about ourselves, that's me. If any of you lack wisdom, and we all do, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and that breedeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So believe and pray. And more of God's wisdom, the same glorious wisdom that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, will be manifest in us and in our walk. But even then, lest you be discouraged, you'll still only get the beginning of the new obedience. Though that isn't the final word, you will by wisdom begin to walk not only according to some but all the commandments of God. Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead, not only by the power and wisdom of God, but also by the righteousness of the Father. Look with me at Romans 4, verse 25, which states that Jesus Christ was delivered because of our offenses and He was raised again because of or on the basis of our justification. And the argument here is that with Christ's death for our sins and his holy life, with our sins being imputed to him and his righteousness being imputed to us and the wisdom of God, then we are righteous. And then if we are righteous... Clearly, from every point of view, Christ then has to be righteous. And if Christ is righteous, then, in the righteousness of God, Christ must be raised from the dead. It would be unrighteous for God to have left his son any longer in the sepulchre. So the glory that raised Christ from the dead was also the glorious righteousness of God it was just and right and fair to lift his son out of death 
And so the believer is called to walk a new life of righteousness, the same righteousness of God manifested in our lives. The standard of righteousness is the moral will of God, which is mentioned in answer 90. It refers to our with love and delight, living according to the will of God. And the moral will of God is summed in the law of God, which is mentioned in answer 91. Which means that walking in righteousness, this new new life of the believer, is a life of good works. Let me read the last question and answer of Lord's Day 33. What are good works? Very simple question. Very basic part of the Christian faith. Only those which proceed from a true faith. Which means that nobody who does not believe in Jesus ever performed a good work. Are performed according to the law of God and to his glory and not such as are founded on our imaginations or on the institutions of men. The question and answer 91 cuts to the ground 99% of all the boasted, vaunted works of sinful, totally depraved men that are held up for admiration and wonder all over the world. They're not good works. They're wicked works. They're dead works. And with regard to the newness of life and walking in it, you can think, for instance, of the book of Psalms. How does the book of Psalms begin? The very first psalm, the first words of the first psalm. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Well, of course not, because he's walking in newness of life. What would he be doing walking in the counsel of the ungodly? Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, as the standard of righteousness, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. We have in Psalm 119, all 176 verses, and we're going through it now in our consecutive singing through the Psalter. A model of the newness of life, the righteous walk of the believer. And Romans chapter 9 explains how this walk affects the use of our bodily members. Romans 6 verse 13. Neither yield ye your members, your bodily members, your hand and your eyes and your head and your legs and so forth. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. There you are. It's forbidden all of us to use a single member or part of our bodies in the service of sin. But instead, yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 19 repeats the thought, referring to our former life and our, contempt, our current life in Christ. As ye have in the past... Yielded your members servants, literally slaves, to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so now yield your members servants or slaves to righteousness unto holiness. Jesus Christ, he was raised from the dead by the glory of his father, which includes his power and his wisdom. And his righteousness. Jesus Christ was also raised from the dead. By the glorious truth. Of the father. Christ's resurrection was promised. By Jesus Christ himself. He said destroy this temple. Referring to his body. Not Herod's temple. 
destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And repeatedly, and particularly the nearer he got to the cross, he said that the Son of Man must be taken by wicked men, the scribes and the Pharisees and the rulers, and they will kill him, and God will raise him up on the third day. And God promises that too in Psalm 16. And so the very truth of God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And now you're getting the idea of the two halves of the second half of Romans 6 verse 4. Because if Jesus Christ was raised up by the glorious truth of God, that has something to say about our walking in newness of life. This means, first of all, that we shed the old lies with which we formerly covered ourselves and which, unless we watch ourselves, will continually bind us and drag us down. The lies about God, which fill the heart and mind of all outside of Jesus Christ. The lies about ourselves and man's supposed innate goodness with which our crazy world is stuffed full even though they can see it day to day, what they're doing, what the world's doing, the new depths of depravity, and they still maintain man's basically good. It's only a matter of education. If we just could build better houses, if the hospitals were better, if we could get people into school, not at four, but at three or at two or at one, and if we could exclude all influence of parents, and we just let the state drum into their heads all the latest philosophies, then man finally would be good. And it's the same philosophy that they've been trying for the last decades and generations and centuries. And lo and behold, man hasn't got one whit better. But they've got nothing else and they're going to keep on trying it. The same old rotten Pelagianism that the church has always opposed. That man's basically good. That through external teaching you can make him better. No, you can make him more civilized. You can make him hide and cover up his sins. You can make him avoid certain sins, but then you're just going to shunt him into other sins. But the walking in newness of life includes that the lies about ourselves, our supposed goodness, our own freedom to serve God, because every man instinctively thinks he has the free will to do good and repent, they're all gone. Walking in newness of life means knowing the truth. And the truth makes us free. Speaking the truth, which brings us grief. And avoiding all lies, as our Heidelberg Catechism puts it, as the proper works of the devil. And finally in this regard, Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead by the glorious love of the Father. Not just righteousness and wisdom and all the rest, but love. Because the Father loved Jesus Christ. And love desires fellowship with the believer and the beloved. And God desired that fellowship with Jesus Christ in his human nature. And so God lifted him up from the sepulcher and lifted him up into heaven and set him on his throne. And in our walking in newness of life, the believer is called to walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, as a sweet-smelling savour, as Ephesians 5 says. Which is love for God, and love for the neighbour, love for one's fellow saint, And love for the church of Jesus Christ. What is the quickening of the new man? What is it? To grow in grace and to feel the life of God in us. It is a sincere joy of heart in God through Christ. And with love and delight to live according to the will of God in all good works as a free man in Jesus Christ and not in bondage to the world or one's own evil lusts. How then are we to do this? 
The answer is, in one word, that the only way to walk in newness of life is through a miracle. That again is the parallel in Romans 6 verse 4. How was it that Jesus Christ walked in his new life as the exalted immortal Lord? It was a miracle. The miracle of the resurrection of him from the dead. And the parallel requires that our new life likewise begins and could only begin with a miracle. The new birth. That's a miracle. Not the sort of miracle that people can see or that was as Christ's miracles verifiable by a doctor and that someone was very obviously sick or had a broken leg or had never walked in their entire life and now they were leaping and jumping on the street. But a real miracle, a direct work of God which was impossible for man to do. The miracle of regeneration. First of all then comes the new life through the new birth which is the new spiritual resurrection life of Jesus Christ which is infused into us by the Holy Spirit. And then this new life shows itself visibly in a new walk when we walk in newness of life as Romans 6 puts it or as is our public confession of faith the vow of all the members of the church who come to the Lord's table our living a new and godly life And if when I speak about this new life which is given to us in the new birth and the new walk or the walk in newness of life and you say to yourself well there are certain things I can understand in the preaching but I certainly don't know really what this man is talking about now. I'm a stranger to this new life but I get the general idea that I've got to be better which is the natural reaction to someone outside of Jesus Christ. But it's the wrong reaction. When you hear about new life and you say, it's not clear to me what that means, but it is clear to me that I don't have it, don't try to make yourself a better person. It's interesting, isn't it? The world thinks that Christianity is all about trying to make people better persons. And most people in the churches think that it's all about making people better persons. But the first message of Christianity is you've got to stop trying to be a better person. You've got to come face to face with your sin. And you've got to admit that you can't be a better person. That you're dead in trespasses and sins. There's no way you can be a better person. And you better stop even making any effort about it and confess that you're dead in trespasses and sins. <laughs> You can't turn over a new leaf. Well, you can do that in the world, but you'll still go to hell. You can't make any better resolutions. Well, you can make them, and if they're not spiritually motivated, you can actually keep them. You can maybe get out of bed half an hour earlier on a Saturday if you want. But that won't change your nature. Scripture says that the carnal man will not submit himself to the righteousness of God and Jesus Christ. He'll keep on thinking to himself, I've got to be righteous. I've got to change myself and make myself good. Then God will accept me. But the calling of all those who don't have this new life is to confess their sins. That's what the gospel commands. Repent and believe the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ is is the saviour and righteousness and life is in him alone so you trust him and stop trusting yourself but with respect to the believer's calling in the new walk this new life implanted in regeneration becomes visible in a similar way 
to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God showed his glorious power and wisdom and righteousness and truth and love in raising him from the dead to a new life. And likewise, though doubtless to a different degree, but it's principally the same glory, God shows his glorious power and wisdom and righteousness and truth and love in the spiritual resurrection of every believer and in his new life and walk. And this glorious power, wisdom, righteousness, truth and love, that's the content of the new man in Christ. That's the content of the image of God in which the child of God has been recreated. And that is the content of our sanctification, our devotion and likeness to Jesus Christ. And if you say, well, you've told me a little bit, bit about the how, but tell me the how of the how, if you know what I mean. Well, I will. How does the child of God then walk more and more in newness of life? What does Lord's Day 33 teach us? What is this mortification of the old man, the quickening of the new man? How are the two contrasted and paralleled? Well, the believer walks in newness of life by continually dying in order to live. We must die in order to live. We must keep on dying to our sins and lusts by God's grace. The believer is commanded to mortify, which means put to death his or her evil inclinations by the Holy Spirit. Because spiritual life comes to us more and more in the way of death to our sins. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. <coughs> Romans eight thirteen. We must die spiritually in order to live. And this is important because sometimes a Christian can feel... You know, I think life's passing me by. I hear sermons. I read things in the Bible about spiritual life, but I don't really feel I'm living. And then they say, I need to join a cookery class. I need more holidays. I need to spend more on clothes. I need to go out to the restaurant with my husband or wife. Now, many of these things have their places in their own way, but these are not the ways in which you will recover your life in Jesus Christ. Instead, as a general rule, think to yourself, what is it I need? Life. What must I do? The exact opposite. I must die to myself. Then you're thinking like a Christian. And if we are not dying to our sins, we are not and cannot live the Christian life as we ought to live it and we're therefore not walking in newness of life as we should do. And we'll feel dissatisfied. We die to live. And you say, that sounds very strange. And maybe the minister is trying to be profound. But it's very simple to work it out. How did Jesus Christ live? How did he live? He lived by continually dying. And after he died, then he really lived with God. Just think the cross. It turns everything on its side and brings you to the heart of it. Not what your own carnal mind will think and not what your next door neighbor will tell you. Similarly, we must continually hate in order to love. We must hate. And by hate, I mean we must hate not God. We mustn't hate goodness. We mustn't hate our neighbor. But we must hate our sin and our sinful nature. To be a Christian, though not in the sense of the politically correct, you have to hate. You have to hate the right things from the heart, by the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to hate. Repentance. Jesus came preaching repentance. What is repentance? Hating your sins. 
Question and answer 89 makes this very obviously confessional. What is the mortification of the old man? It's more and more to hate the sins which provoke God and flee from them. You can't be a Christian without hating sins, especially your own sins. That is, you cannot love God or your neighbor without hating your sins. And it's as we hate our sins in repentance that God works his love in our hearts. So we hate in order to love. And if we're not hating our sins and our old man, then we're not loving God and our neighbor as we ought. And we're not walking in newness of life according to the new man as we ought and should. We must die in order to live. We must hate in order to love. And we must continually sorrow in order to rejoice. If I said, who is there in church who doesn't want more joy in their life? I've used too many negatives. I'm confused now. But everyone, everyone wants more joy in their life. But how do you get joy? How does the world get joy? More drink, more drugs, have an affair. You think I'm exaggerating? No, no, I'm not. Doubtless everybody doesn't choose those, but that consists of a large segment of the unbelieving world where scripture says that the way to rejoice is to sorrow over your sins. That's the argument of James 4. (coughs) Sorrow over the wicked old man. And by the sorrow of repentance, God gives us joy in our hearts. The reason we don't have the joy we should is we're not confessing our sins and battling against our old natures the way we should. And so don't go looking for joy in the same places that your neighbor's looking for it. That's why he's an unbeliever. He doesn't know to look in the right places. And don't be following his foolish advice. Your hairdresser isn't going to tell you the way out of this hole. The word of God is. It all sounds a bit paradoxical, but it's true. In the sorrow of repentance, God works his joy in our hearts. And if you say afresh, but I still want joy, then you ought to think too, what sort of joy do I want? Do you want joy in the Lord? Well, until you can say I want joy in the Lord, you can't go anywhere. You've got to get back to that. I want joy in the Lord. Now you're, now you're talking. Now you're thinking the straight. <clears throat> well, the way to get joy in the Lord is to sorrow over your sins. And you say, but I don't want this joy in the way of sorrowing over my sins. Well, sorry, can't help you. There is no other way. Then you may as well listen to your hairdresser and the person next door. And, you know, and really, let's be honest, you're hardly likely to stay in the Christian church. Because if you keep living and thinking like that, you will not stay in the Christian church. Because the Christian church preaches the cross. Preaches you must sorrow over your sins to receive joy. You must follow the way of the cross. And that's Lord's Day 33. What is the quickening of the new man? It's sincere joy of heart in God. So that with love and delight... I want to live according to the will of God and all good works. And everybody says, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want. Yeah, but there's two parts to conversion. Everybody likes the bit about joy and sincere joy and love and delight and walking in God's will and doing good works. It's all wonderful. But you can't have that without the first part. The mortification of the old man. The sincere sorrow of heart that I have provoked God by my sins. But I don't want to confess my sins. I just want to go and have a good time. Then you're not thinking any different from an unbeliever. I don't like hating and fleeing from my sins. Well, you can't have quickening of the new man without mortification of the old man. The two go hand in hand. That's conversion. That's the way it was when you first came to Jesus Christ. You hated your sins. And you look to him alone. That's the same way you must live the Christian life. Walking in newness of life. Dying to live. Hating to love. (coughs) And sorrowing to rejoice. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, grant to us this newness of life.
and this sorrow over sin, that we may know the cross of Christ at work in our lives, that we may follow Jesus Christ and experience the life and joy of the Spirit as we turn from our wicked ways. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.